It's been a little over a month since Prime Minister Modi announced his decision to demonetize 86% of the currency in circulation of 500 and 1,000 rupee notes. The debate in India rages on. Was this a masterstroke or a misadventure? Joining us now from Columbia University is somebody who is, of course, very well respected as an economist, but is also one of the foremost thinkers and public intellectuals of our time, Professor Jagdish Bhagwati. Professor Bhagwati, welcome to the program. Let me first ask you for your big picture impression. This is a very disruptive decision. Some people have called it bold. Others have said that it is absolutely, uh, in a sense, bad news for the economy. How do you see, sir, uh, this decision? Uh, I don't see it as a bad decision at all. Uh, we have to distinguish between uh, avoidable losses and unavoidable losses which may result from a big decision like this. For instance, when you have to print large numbers of notes, which are going to be replacing the 500 and the 1,000 rupee notes, if you actually order huge numbers of these things, there's no way you could keep it quiet, because people are bound to know. Uh, I mean, there's no way. In, 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 in India, in particular, nothing is ever kept secret for long. So given that, if you were to actually start printing ahead of time large numbers of notes, uh, it's bound to leak out, and that is, will itself create massive disruption. So, some, so, so this is what I call a transitional loss. Um, no, don't call it short run, because people mean different things by short run and long run. But this is something where it was an unavoidable loss, and I think now that the measure has been taken, uh, the, People are coming out, and you know, the, the government is actually printing large numbers of notes. Uh, and so it, it is what I would call a transitional loss. Um, there are people who have actually come out saying that this is actually uh, a bad idea so simply because you look at the notes. I wonder if anybody looks at them uh, <laughs> with that degree of care. But it says, I promise to pay. Now, so some economists have actually pointed out. Uh, wrongly in my opinion, that this amounts to an abrogation of the <clears throat> obligation to pay. <laughs> if you t were to take a note into a, into a bank anywhere uh, or into the RBI or wherever it can be exchanged and you present it, <clears throat> they'll just give you another note. So <laughs> it's cockeyed to say that this is some sort of abrogation of the <clears throat> obligation to pay. Then the people are also talking about how this is actually uh, in violation of the right to property. That also is cockeyed because if you go back, I mean, I've, I know something about the Indian Constitution having taught it at Columbia for, for a few years. Amendment 1 <clears throat> was actually passed way back uh, to enable us to actually impound property in a social cause. Uh, this is sometimes called taking, you know, uh, where you pick up a piece of property uh, which is necessary. Uh, and you, you, of course, have to pay some compensation for it. But the point is, you can do that. So zamindari abolition, uh, the, the purses, you know, the, uh, the, the privy purses of the pr princes and so on, all of these would have been struck down by the, by the uh, Supreme Court if there had not been an amendment uh, of this kind. So I think the notion that somehow we are doing something undemocratic doesn't seem to me to make so these kinds of criticisms i think are not well taken in my view and i think people just shoot from the hip but this doesn't mean there are no problems which we have to worry about so let me ask you to talk first you said that you don't think that the very idea itself was problematic but you've seen the data only six percent of black money is estimated to be in cash some might say then that what you call a transitional period a transitional phase of discomfort is not worth it because the end result in itself may not achieve much given how little of the black money is in fact in cash um I, I think that's the wrong way to pose the problem, in my view. Uh, the, what we are trying to do is the masses of hordes of cash in the Almiras and so on, right? right. Which are lying there, <laughs> which are sometimes used to transact money, like if you want to sell a house, 
uh, it is going to be difficult for people like you and me to sell a house because people demand that you, uh, or that or people rec demand that they pay in black money rather than yes, white sir. money. Yes, and yes. if you and I are not prepared to take that money, the black money, then we cannot even transact. So the, you know, so I think those kinds of structural difficulties uh, are a problem. Now, no measure in in itself is going to eliminate all possible holds. Now, all of us know people uh, who actually are holding Swiss accounts, uh, all kinds of accounts abroad. There's no way you're going to catch that. Uh, and how do you catch that? Tell me. I mean, I don't know of any way to, to do that. Of course, all kinds of uh, foreign accounts come to light, but they come to light, and we don't even know whether those the names which are being actually coming out from some of these accounts yeah. are, in fact, correctly put down there. If I don't like you, Barker, yeah. I, I do like you, <laughs> but supposing if I didn't, yes. I could just put your name down. It's like WikiLeaks and so on. Yes. Uh, you know, so I think the, the it's easier said than done. Uh, I, my own feeling is uh, that we, at the margin, meaning additionally, what we want to do is to say that, look, where does this black money really originate from? Yes. And that is a better way to think about it than how to catch it uh, or how to catch the outflows which have already occurred. That's a much bigger problem. But do you, do you, but agree, in, yeah, do you agree with your old friend, Dr. Manmohan Singh, who stood up in parliament and said that this would shave off at least 2% of the GDP? Uh, would you accept that to be an accurate assessment? Well, I, I mean, uh, an assessment always has to be problematic based on assumptions. My own feeling is, uh, I mean, Dr. Manon Singh is a very good friend of mine, as you doubtless know, uh, and it's difficult for me to criticize that uh, in any way, uh, simply because uh, he's making an assumption which is actually, in my frank view, ideological. Uh, because the Congress party lost in a very big way, as you know. Uh, and the same thing is going on in this country, in the United States, where the Democrats, I'm one myself, ha have lost uh, to, to Donald Trump. Yes. And they're trying their damnedest best to think of all sorts of ways why, why the outcome should not be accepted. So I think Dr. Manmohan Singh is actually making, saying that this is something which has led to monumental difficulties. I don't think that's true. But I think as a, as a member of the Congress party, uh, uh, if he had to say something, though I would much rather wish that he had said nothing, because this, this is a fairly complicated issue. Uh, and I wouldn't give you, as you know, uh, an interview until I'd had time to study all the different ramifications. It's not that I've necessarily gotten it right, but I certainly would, was not rushing in uh, with all kinds of pronouncements. As a, I think the prime minister, the former prime minister, should not have rushed in. Uh, though it's, it's not within my province to give him any advice on this matter. But you also had people like uh, uh, Mr. Chidambaram, whom also I hold in very high regard, again rushing in. But you see, these are political types, and or, or viewing it as a political obligation uh, to say something like this. You see. So I, I would take, take it with a grain of salt. Yes, there are difficulties, and I would, I, rather than calling them uh, short run, I would say transitional difficulties. Uh, and then the other point I would make is uh, that, I mean, take one example. Uh, I'm, I'm holding a fair amount of uh, this black money in 500,000 uh, rupee notes. If I want to convert it, uh, without having to go into the into the bank or something and being sort of detected doing it, uh, I would call in my servant. Uh, we we do that all the time and say, look, I'm going to give you a thousand rupees. Go and uh, you know convert it, and I will give you thirty percent of that. Yes. Now let, let's that take let's take that scenario because it's not 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 the only one. So if you take that scenario, the money which was inactive and just lying in the Almira <laughs> will become active. And 30% of that will go to the poor, to the, the guy who did it for me. And that guy doesn't have any, uh, <laughs> any real money, so he's going to go and spend the money. So there are two effects. One is there's a redistribution, right from the rich guy to the poor guy. Uh, 
and the other is that that poor guy is going to spend the money. So here I'm giving. But isn't that the laundering of black money into white? Because that's what happened with yeah, the yeah, Jandhan. Yeah, yeah, that's that's okay. what's happened with the Jandhan accounts, with the surge in deposits, yeah. as you know. But I, I wouldn't worry about that because what this does is to basically convert black money into white under a specific scheme yes. where the where the poor people are the beneficiaries, uh, and that is that means. In terms of I'm, what I'm going to t tell you is that in, under this scenario, the poor are better off, right? Because they didn't have that 30% before. And two, they're going to spend the money. So here is one case where money that was simply lying around or maybe transacted for some black transactions, that money is now being activated and is being spent. So here is one scenario where actually I would expect expect an expansionary effect, not a deflationary effect. But it would still be a kind of corruption, Professor Bhagwati. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, a, it, it's not a corruption. What it does is to say, basically, that we are getting rid of this, uh, this stock of, uh, or at least decimating it as far as possible. We are decimating it uh, and saying that money destructs. And the guy who was holding it, he loses 30% of it. And so it's fine. I mean, you know, there are amnesty schemes all over the world or for all kinds of things. So this is something which doesn't bother me. Uh, but, look at, but look at the you deposits, uh, Professor Bhagwati, that have come back into the banks, right? Since right, demonetization, right. Uh, uh, there are nearly 12 lakh crores that are already back in bank deposits. The value of That's five, right. right? So the value of 500 from, 1000 from rupee us, notes is about 14 and, point. Three lakh crores. So, what does that mean? Does yeah. that mean that the black money was overestimated, or that the black money has simply come back into the system as white? Well, but that is what an amnesty amounts to. You see, uh, in the sense that if the money was simply lying there or being transacted for the black black market, uh, then what we have done is to say, look, we'll take it out from that particular parallel market, as sometimes it's called. And we will turn it into, through an amnesty basically, into uh, essentially taking it out of circulation as black money. So, you know, if we object to that, that's very much like objecting to an amnesty, uh, which, which is universally tried in all kinds of contexts. So that doesn't bother me, uh, really, in the sense that we are taking it out. And, and uh, uh, the fact that a lot of money was not printed in time uh, doesn't bother me either because you could not have brought it out without the thing leaking out. What what is astonishing is that you know from the currency in circulation, meaning the currency which is out in the uh, in the public uh, sphere, that was what about uh, 15 lakh crores. Yes. <clears throat> of that now 11 and a half crores as of 9th December yes. was actually you know converted and brought back. So I, my worry is not about that. I actually, I see that as a sign of success. And as Gurcharan Das, et cetera, pointed out, uh, we can now go full speed <clears throat> in terms of getting all kinds of uh, foreign agencies and so on, which, which actually print money, to, to go full blast at it. <clears throat> and the fact that it is being done is not going to embarrass anybody or, or, or sabotage any particular program, because secrecy is no longer required. But, but, it was but then you're actually earlier. saying that the laundering of black to white doesn't bother you because it, as long as it destroys the parallel economy of black money, you think one aim has been achieved. Right, exactly. And, and it is being achieved in a way which also actually enables, it, at least in, in the scenario which I was giving you, which is not the only one, but it, it's, I think, the principal one, that it, you, know, you use the poor people to help you uh, queue up and, 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 and go ahead and convert, it has a redistributive effect. And I think that is, to me, you may call it populism, but it's taking money 30% away from the rich and giving it to the poor. And I think that's a wonderful idea. And this is why, actually, when people say, oh, this is undemocratic and so on, I mean, some people have also pointed out that if it was undemocratic, <laughs> the poor people are a majority in the country. How come there's no huge uprising anywhere? And the poor people, I mean, I talk to people who come back from India, uh, and I'll, I'll soon be there myself to test for myself in a, 
you know, stop or so. <laughs> the people are happy actually. And so that is because they are benefiting. And two, there's also the sense that the rich have been getting away with it. Right. Meaning, you know, and so I think the, it is democratic in that sense. It so is when populist. Your friend, when your friend Amartya Sen calls it despotic, you clearly don't agree. No, how can I agree with that? And I think the, uh, I mean, I can forget the prime minister and, and uh, what's our uh, Chidambaram, uh, <clears throat> who are politicians having to rush in with statements because they, they have no option actually if they're part of the Congress party. Uh, but but my good friend should should have been a little more circumspect. I feel, which is as far as I will go. Can I ask you in the end, you said that there are problems. What is the biggest problem that you see with everything you've observed so far? Because one does see daily wage laborers suffering. We see people, you know, farmers or labor that works in the fields. We've seen a cash crunch there. We've seen small and medium enterprises hurt. Uh, there is one uh, report that actually says that jobs are going to be hit in, in a major way, that four lakh jobs may have already been, been hit. What is it that worries you the most about how this is being implemented? Because you clearly agree with the decision what worries you or concerns you about the implementation I think the the implementation uh, so far had unavoidable <clears throat> problems like not, lack of cash uh, <clears throat> because we couldn't print it in the head without it leaking out and so on so these were uh, unavoidable delays now have there been avoidable delays that that would that's what one has to ask to be able to answer your question and I think there, uh, <clears throat> I think what we have to do is to make sure that the money is pumped out into the system through, through Nandan Nilakani's accounts and so on, <clears throat> and directly given to the poor, uh, so as to compensate for the monies, the big notes which will be withdrawn. Yes. So there is a smooth transition. So there's no shortage of cash. Secondly, I don't really buy into these because I've, I've studied the Indian economy, as you know, for decades. And the problem is basically that we, we tend to rush to judgment, uh, like, why can't we export more? So we were always talking about problems about the foreign markets and so on. And when I used to go around and people said, we are not worried about whether the markets abroad are closed or open, because they are open. The problem is at our own end. We, we, we just have all kinds of crazy rules and so on. So in that sense, what I'm saying is that what we want to do is to make sure that the cash is made available rapidly uh, as soon as we get it printed. Already a huge amount has been put into circulation. But I think we have to be absolutely sure uh, it's something well, only bureaucrats, I mean, decent bureaucrats can do. Economists should not be consulted on this because this is not our forte at all. But I think we need man, men of practical experience, men and women of practical experience, doing that sort of thing. So making sure that the transition is as short-lived as possible. So very briefly in the end, when the RBI governor, Urujit Patel, was appointed, you were among those who welcomed that choice. Uh, he's been under yeah. focus a lot. Uh, people feel he should have been more up, up front, out there, visible, speaking, that in some ways, the, you know, the, the authority of the RBI has somehow been undermined. Uh, you know, that's what critics are saying today. Any last thoughts on that? I, I think, again, you see, uh, Urujit Patel comes in without any background in this sort of thing. And this is also, I mean, I'm not a, a, a stupid economist, as you know. <laughs> and I wanted to study it at some length. Who is this a stupid economist, sir? I have to ask you, who is a stupid, <laughs> who, who is a stupid economist? Who are you talking about? <laughs> you, you, you are a smart person. You can make your own inference. <laughs> OK, go on. Go on, complete your thought. So I think the point is it suddenly came out of the blue. And I'm told economists were not even consulted because most of the driving force was security. The, 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 the fact that Pakistan possibly was printing lots of uh, counterfeit money. So apparently it was the decision I'm told by many economists, friends in India, that they were not even consulted on the decision. It was just taken on security ground. So in a way to go and blame uh, smart economists like Urjit Patel and so on for not having uh, moved in more quickly 
it is a bit unfair. It is a bit unfair. But once they got into it, they started tweaking and then trust started worrying about it and how best to fix the problems which were arising. So I, I think the in, in, in America we call it Monday morning quarterbacking, meaning after the event you say, ah, oh, you could have thought through something like that. But this is such a big thing. In that sense, I agree with my friend Manmohan Singh that it is a very big thing. But because it's so very big, it is very difficult to say you can really sort out everything ahead of time. And a good policy consists not in the infeasible yeah. art of anticipating every problem, but be, being smart on the move. So as soon as problems arise, you tweak the thing. Like, like I mean, you know, the, the Income Tax Amendment Act on November 28, uh, which changes a little bit what was done on November 8 when the thing was announced. That is part of the tweaking. So what you want in a good policy maker is not that you anticipate everything, particularly when a gigantic thing like this is being undertaken, but that you be ready to move in as problems develop. And I think there I would give our e economists uh, a fairly good mark. All right, it's a good mark from Professor Bhagwati, at least on the demonetization thing. And I'm guessing in the end, it's a thumbs up to the demonetization uh, scheme and the disruption it has caused. You're saying the losses uh, is, is, is a transitional uh, phase. Uh, Professor Bhagwati, it has been a pleasure, as always, having you on the program. Thank you, Martha.